tonight on Reporting Scotland. Last-ditch efforts to stall council tax rises in two areas fail. Both Inverclyde and Argyll and Butte councils are going ahead with what the Scottish Government calls unjustifiable increases. What do residents make of it? I would be happy to pay if I knew the resources were going to, you know, like the NHS, education, housing. Considering they say Inverclyde's a deprived area, it's kind of shocking that they're putting it up in a more deprived area than the rest of Scotland. Also on tonight's programme, a woman who fled the war in Ukraine tells us about her hopes of seeing her husband again. I love him and that uh, I'll be waiting for him. We'll have a beautiful fu future together, the uh, two of us and our cat. I don't know about kids now. Elsewhere, three teenagers have pleaded guilty to attempting to murder a 13-year-old boy on a train in Glasgow. And in the sport, we're in Rome, where Scotland are preparing for their penultimate Six Nations match against Italy, still with an outside chance of winning the tournament. And the American Pie and Schitt's Creek actor Eugene Levy explores his Scottish heritage. Hello, I'm Sally Magnuson. Welcome to Friday's programme. When announcing his surprise freeze on council tax, the First Minister said it would provide financial relief to two and a half million households across Scotland. But so far, two local authorities, Argyll and Butte and Inverclyde, have gone against the government order on this and hiked their council tax bills by 10% and 8% respectively. They say this will minimise cuts to services and avoid job losses. Today, the two councils have been locked in last-ditch talks with the Deputy First Minister in an attempt to strike a deal. Our news correspondent, Jamie McIver, has the story. You make it for your heart. You make this for your mum. The First Minister was marking International Women's Day today. What do you think? Macy, what do you think? Macy. Highlighting how affordable childcare like this facility in Glasgow helps women back into work. Across Scotland, councils play a big role providing early learning and childcare. But Mr Yusuf's plan for a national council tax freeze hasn't gone down well with some councils. He wants the two planning to put it up to think again. Well, I hope Argyll and Butte and Inverclyde will do what every single other council across the country has done, which is freeze their council tax because they're getting above inflation a fully funded a commitment from the government to freeze that council tax. So every other local authority has done so. As Mr Yusuf visited the nursery, his deputy was preparing to talk to the two councils in a last-ditch effort to get them to freeze bills. 30 miles away in Greenock, people are facing an 8.2% rise in council tax. Opinion is split. Sammy owns his own business and isn't opposed to paying more. I would be happy to pay if I knew the resources were going to, you know, like education, housing, all these sort of things that really matter. But some question why the tax should be rising here. Considering they say Inverclyde's a deprived area, it's kind of shocking that they're putting it up in a more deprived area than the rest of Scotland. And they're thinking of putting council tax up in Inverclyde, but maybe not anywhere else. You know, it's, it, that doesn't make much sense to me. Councils which freeze the tax will get more Scottish Government money. Their share of £147 million specifically to freeze it, plus a share of £62 million made available through this week's UK budget. Oh, you did it! Well done! It's high stakes for Hamza Yusuf and councils. If even two put up council tax, his opponents are likely to exploit it. Jamie joins me now. Any chance of these two councils reconsidering that? I think we can now say it's virtually certain the council tax will go up in Inverclyde. The council there says there is no progress in the talks. It argued it should be able to put up the council tax without losing any Scottish government money, but offered a compromise, essentially a special rebate in the coming year. Keep an eye on Argyll and Butte, though. Some uh, different signs there. There seems to have been some progress. The council describing the talks as positive and saying discussions will continue. Now, it's worth me making the point that 
that all other councils will freeze council tax, but this year we can't say it will be a national freeze. There have been several national freezes since the SNP came to power back in 2007. But what happened this year basically demonstrates that ultimately it's councils which will decide individually whether a freeze is the right thing or not. A freeze has to be negotiated and agreed between uh, councils and the Scottish Government. The big question, of course, how will voters respond to higher bills? Indeed. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, for that update. A woman who fled the war in Ukraine and now lives in Aberdeen says she still believes her husband is alive, despite not seeing him for nearly two years. Oksana's husband was captured by Russians while fighting for the, um, the Ukrainian army in Mariupol in April 2022. She spoke to Graham Fraser. Mariupol. The Russians captured this city in the early months of the war. This is one of the Ukrainian soldiers who was taken prisoner there. We will call him Alexei. Yeah, that's the first time. His wife, Oksana, escaped the war in Ukraine and is now in Scotland. Once he called me and said that uh, Russians uh, threw an aerial bomb on them and the fragment of this bomb was in his head. A lot of people died there because of this uh, bomb and he was just... Uh, Devastated. Almost two years after the Russians took her husband, Oksana is desperate to get him back. If you could speak to him right now, what message would you like to send to him? I would say that I, that I love him and that uh, I'll be waiting for him. We'll have a beautiful fu future together, uh, two of us and our cat. I don't know about kids now. Oksana received a letter from Alexei from a Russian jail in September 2022. She hasn't heard from him since. I got a letter from him. Uh, it was saying that he's, uh, he's alive, he's okay. They treated him well and then he, that he loved me. But it looks like they uh, dictate them what to write. But other prisoners who were released say Alexei was still in jail in January this year. Here in Aberdeen, Oksana has made a life for herself. She loves the local people and works here as a housekeeper. But all she wants is her husband and for their life together to continue. Yeah, of course, after my husband will come back, I definitely want to stay in Ukraine because it's my home. Oksana talking there to Graham Fraser. Three teenagers have pleaded guilty at the High Court in Glasgow to attempting to murder a 13-year-old boy on a train in the city in October 2021. The victim of the attack at High Street Station was left brain damaged. The incident occurred just 24 hours before another teenage boy was murdered on the platform of the same station. Katrina Renton reports. The three male teenagers who attacked the 13-year-old boy were aged 16, 15 and 13 at the time of the attack. The boy and a friend got on the train at Glasgow's High Street Station on the 15th of October 2021. One of the trio was heard to say, let's do this. Footage filmed by one of them was circulated online. CCTV from the train was played in court. It showed the three racing towards the boy who immediately ran off down the carriage. The three attackers caught up with him and he stumbled and fell to the floor. He was repeatedly stamped and jumped upon during the attack, which lasted around 20 seconds, and he was left unconscious. The three got off the train at the next station, leaving the 13-year-old for dead. The trio were seen hugging each other after they ran upstairs onto the street. Other passengers on the train went to help the teenager and the emergency services met the train when it stopped at Airdrie. The court heard the boy had suffered a significant brain injury, a fractured collarbone and bruising and swelling. He missed two years of school and has been treated for PTSD. The court heard the boy, who is now 16, has made a good physical recovery, but he continues to have behaviour and memory issues, which are likely to last for life. The court heard the attackers were caught after the eldest of the three confessed to his mum that he had been involved. He told police officers that he had stamped on the boy's head and that there were loads of us, not just me. The two others were arrested after they were identified from the footage. In an unrelated incident, the day after this attack, 
14-year-old Justin McLaughlin was stabbed at High Street Station. He died in hospital. Daniel Haig, who was 16 at the time, was given a life sentence for murder and ordered to serve a minimum of 16 years in prison. The three teenagers who pleaded guilty today to attempting to murder the 13-year-old have been bailed and will be sentenced next month. Katrina Renton, reporting Scotland. The former director of a police watchdog has admitted failings in the way it investigated the death of Sheku Bayo. Almost 10 years on from his death, an inquiry is looking into the circumstances surrounding it. Stephen Gordon has the story. Sheku Bayo died in May 2015 after being restrained by police officers on a Kirkcaldy street. For almost two years, a public inquiry has been hearing evidence about the fatal incident, its aftermath and whether race was a factor. Today's witness was John Mitchell, now retired but at the time second in command at Perk, the watchdog tasked with investigating the police response. Mr Mitchell was asked about a Crown Office document that reviewed the initial work done by Perk. It found that investigators hadn't compared the statements they were given by police officers with the recordings of the radio transmissions from the incident to determine whether there had been any attempt to mislead them. To Henry Road, a disturbance ongoing, mail arm to the line. A later comparison found that what one officer said he heard on the radio about a suspect with a sword didn't match the transcript. Do you agree that Perk had not compared the officer's statements with the airwave transcripts as part of the investigation. I have to agree with that statement there. Uh, Do you agree it was one of the necessary steps that should have been taken? It's a line of inquiry which should have been considered and undertaken. Mr Mitchell agreed the report identified other failings, proofreading errors that led to inaccurate statements being submitted, the timing of witness videos not being recorded, which meant their significance was missed, and police radio communications being wrongly attributed by Perk investigators. Having looked at this now, do you agree that this is the sort of uh, detail that Perk should have been picking up as part of the investigation? Yes. And do you, would you agree that failure to do so is a, a failure in the investigation? I don't think I could say otherwise. Thank you. The examination of Perk's response has now finished. When the inquiry returns next month, its focus will be on decisions made by the Crown Office. Stephen Gordon reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Some of the day's other stories now. A Rangers fan has died in Lisbon after the club's Europa League match against Benfica last night. He was named as 25-year-old Thomas McAllister from Glasgow. Rangers said they would remain in constant contact with the Portuguese and British authorities over the incident. A spokesperson for the Foreign Office said they were providing consular assistance to the family of a British man who died in Lisbon. A woman has been charged after police were called to a house in Coat Bridge to restrain an XL bully dog. It happened yesterday outside a property in Broughton Place. A vet was brought in to put the dog down. A 30-year-old woman was charged with an offence relating to the Dangerous Dogs Act. No one was injured. The Grand Orange Lodge of Scotland is appealing Aberdeenshire Council's decision to block its parade in Stonehaven next Saturday. The Council Committee voted unanimously in favour of stopping the match earlier this week after hearing objections from residents worried about the possibility of violence and local businesses closing for the day. The Grand Orange Lodge of Scotland said it was working with its legal team to organise a hearing at Aberdeen Sheriff Court. The Canadian actor Eugene Levy is known for leading roles in hit series like Schitt's Creek and American Pie, but it's his Scottish connections that are occupying him at the moment. His mother lived in the Gorbals in Glasgow's south side. Tracing her roots has been an emotional journey, as David Farrell's been finding out. Oh, uh -huh. Have a very pleasant stay. Eugene Levy is best known as Johnny Rose from TV sitcom Schitt's Creek, but for his latest role, he's tracing his Scottish heritage, a deeply affecting experience. Uh, there was a connection made from almost the moment I, I, I got to Scotland and, and, you know, kind of felt that connection that I, I just didn't think I would be feeling quite as strongly. And here's a photograph of the family. Your mother is, I think she's one of the youngest. 
Is that her? I think that might be her. Yeah, that's my mum. Yikes. Stopping off in Glasgow on our way to Canada, Eugene's mum set up home in the Gorbals for 13 years. And what he saw was quite different from the stories he was told. Uh, I've only seen some pictures of what the Gorbals was. because She never talked about how difficult a situation it was. You know, and that's what that's what kind of struck me. This is like four or five people in a room, in a bed, and a thing, sleeping in the kitchen, sleeping. And she never talked about that. She never talked about the hardship of it. She just talked about, you know, what whatever any other mm -hmm. child would talk about growing up with their family. Do you feel quite close to us Scots in any way, given your heritage? I have to say, I love the Scottish people because, you know, in that Scottish brogue, I, that's how I grew up. My grandfather lived with us as well, and he had the thickest Scottish brogue. Uh, my mom always thought she lost her dialect, but she never did. Uh, it was always still there, and all my uncles and aunts had that little Scottish brogue, so there was such familiarity when I was over there you know, kind of hearing this and and a very dry, I, I got to say, the Scots have a very dry sense of humor that really appeals to me too. So maybe our Scottish humor has been a bigger influence on Eugene's career than he's aware. Warmest wishes, kindest regards, David Farrell reporting Scotland. You know, so here comes our dry sense of humour, Amy. Yes. <laughs> Six <laughs> Nations. Six <laughs> Nations, yes. It's, uh, Scotland still have so much to play for. It returns this weekend, Sally. Thanks very much. Scotland are in Italy looking to do what they can to keep their Six Nations chances alive this weekend. Gregor Townsend's side are in second place behind Ireland going into the penultimate round of fixtures and depending on what happens tomorrow could set up a showdown for the championship in Dublin next week. Andy Burke sends this report from Rome. Well, on paper, this looks like a fairly routine assignment for Scotland and the Six Nations. Their recent record against Italy is tremendous. They've won their past 13 meetings, but that only tells a part of the story when the sides met in Edinburgh last season it went down to the wire Scotland just about managing to get themselves over the line and Italy came agonisingly close to a first ever victory on French soil in round three so Scotland yes favourites but certainly respectful of the threat their hosts pose here tomorrow. In terms of their title aspirations, that's not in their own hands. That is in the hands of Ireland when they go to Twickenham to face England tomorrow after the game here. A bonus point victory for the Irish, no matter the result here at the Olympico, will mean that Andy Farrell's side will have sealed the championship with one round remaining. But Scotland can't afford to get caught up in all of that. They can only deal with what they have control over, namely delivering a victory here at the Stadio Olimpico tomorrow. Well, it will be a 70,000 sellout tomorrow with 15,000 Scots there. We caught up with some of them before they set off this afternoon. Home, obviously, for a Scotland win. Absolutely. And dare I say it, an England win as well. I think we've got a decent team. Um, good to see Big Doohan playing, so hopefully he'll break the, the Scottish record uh, tomorrow. But, yeah, that, that's the main thing. Otherwise, my friends will give me absolute jip for it in the evening. <laughs> Vandermeer would score another couple of tries, that would be nice, a bit of Finn Russell magic. Sounds good. And a couple of cold Peronis alongside that. When in Rome. Well, on to football now, and Celtic manager Brendan Rodgers says he has no regrets over his criticism of officials and will defend himself vigorously after being charged by the SFA. Rodgers mentioned VAR official John Beaton by name as he claimed really poor officiating in last Sunday's loss at Hearts. Meanwhile, ahead of this Sunday's Scottish Cup quarter-final at home to Livingston, Israeli winger Leo Labada has completed his move to Major League Soccer side Charlotte, signing a deal there until 2026. Now ahead of tomorrow's Scottish Cup quarter-final against Aberdeen, David Watson believes in-form Kilmarnock are entitled to fancy their chances of going all the way. The 19-year-old midfielder scored last time they played at Pataudry and having beaten the Dons three times this term, while also defeating the two current Cup favourites, Celtic and Rangers, Watson feels his side are well-equipped to try to land their first trophy in 12 years. You've got to believe you're going to win it, so um, I think we've got the potential, we've got the squad there as well, the squad depth as well. We've seen there's been a, a few changes in that, we've been... 
have not played as much as, but that's because there's other boys in the team that have been playing well and they are, they've um, done well. We've not been beat that much of recent. We've only been beat by Rangers. Apart from that, we've not really been beat. So I think we can face MD in the league and go into it with confidence and win. Lauren Shanklin says he's happy at hearts and focused on winning silverware with the Tynecastle side ahead of Monday's last eight tie with Morton. In a wide-ranging interview, the hearts captain, who has scored 27 goals for the club this season, spoke about his career so far, his ambition to play in the Euros and transfer speculation. Of course, if the opportunity to, to maybe win things that you wouldn't win and play in places that you wouldn't play, at hearts come about then it would obviously be tempting it's a football career and I'm the same as every other player in that aspect but as I said I'd never be disrespectful of the situation I'm in I'm under contract at hearts I love it here um, I'm loved by the fans and that's obviously a huge help in, in things that I do week to week and you can see more of that interview on Sports Scene tomorrow finally Scottish UFC star Joanne Wood has announced she will retire from the sport after this weekend's fight with Ukraine's Marina Moroz and says she wants to bow out on a high the 38 year old who was Scotland's first professional female MMA fighter insists she'll be fully focused as she brings the curtain down on her career in Miami I've just not got time for to be emotional in that sense you know, I have a, a fight ahead of me, so I want to give my all to that. And then, you know, I can be a ball and baby afterwards, like, oh my gosh, it's been so, so good. And yeah, bye career. <laughs> That's the way I'm, to go, isn't I'm, it? I thought I've done that a few times, probably, Sally, <laughs> said goodbye to her career. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very Thanks, much Sally. indeed, Amy. Now it's over to Laura Miller to find out what's happening on BBC Scotland at seven o'clock. Coming up on the 7 as the US announces its plans to construct a temporary port in Gaza to allow more aid through and the UK and EU support them with a sea corridor. How significant a move is this by the international community? We'll ask a Middle East expert. Also tonight on the eve of Scotland's crucial Six Nations clash in Rome, we speak to the former rugby international Hugo Southwell. Plus, entertainment reporting royalty Ross King on this weekend's Oscars. Switch over at 7. See you then, Laura. In the meantime, Jamie Genevieve from Glasgow began her career behind the beauty counter of a department store. Now she's the founder of a multi-million pound beauty business. On International Women's Day, Hope Webb spoke to her about the journey from makeover queen to boardroom and motherhood. This is Jamie Genevieve's happy place at home in her office and studio where she manages her multi-million pound makeup brand, Vive. The business started as a small dream and now features over 250 successful products. Having the business and having Vive is something that I've wanted um, for a long time. Uh, you know, at one point it was just me that was working on the, the plans myself. Um, but over the last three years, for the business to have grown um, to what it's become, is it, it just means everything to me. Jamie's success initially grew from a YouTube channel she launched 10 years ago. At the time, she worked on a beauty counter in Glasgow city centre and started filming makeup tutorials at home. Today, she still films content for her 1 million subscribers, but rather than being known as an influencer, she prefers CCO and founder. For me to be sitting here with Vive and it still only feels like the beginning for Vive is the most exciting place to be. So I just feel, I feel extremely grateful. But it's not just business matters vying for Jamie's time now. 10 months ago, her and her husband welcomed a daughter and motherhood has changed her outlook. The mum guilt thing was something that I thought about quite a lot. I um, have been kind of, I suppose, strict with myself on trying not to feel that too much. I, I think that my work is so important to me. It's something I love, but Romeo is the best thing I've ever done in my life. It's literally, she's, she's just the most incredible little girl. And I think that having that kind of laser focus, I actually think has, has made my like, life and my work much better. Jamie now wants to help shape the beauty industry for her daughter and for a future generation of young women. But she's already positive about the direction it's going in. I think the beauty industry is really exciting. I think it's never been more inclusive. People are celebrated and are encouraged to feel beautiful in themselves more than ever. So I'm happy. I'm happy about that. <laughs> Here's Gillian now with the weather.
Thanks very much, Sally. Good evening to you. It's been a day of cloudy skies for many of us. West was best today in terms of sunshine. Lovely picture here from one of our weather watchers. Through this week, we've been in a bit of a pattern of quite brisk east southeasterly winds, bringing lots of cloud into eastern Scotland with the best of the breaks across the west. And we'll stick with that pattern tonight. So plenty of cloud filtering in off the North Sea. It should stay largely dry. The clearest skies will be across western Scotland and it will be on the chilly side, temperatures low single figures and low enough for a touch of frost in some sheltered highland glens. So quite a chilly start to tomorrow. Once again, we'll pull in plenty of cloud. Brightness tomorrow, I think, will be pretty limited and that cloud thick enough to produce some patchy rain in places. So this is the picture around about three o'clock and you can see some patchy outbreaks of rain for Dumfries and Galloway, the borders, some extending up into the central belt into Fife, Angus, the Aberdeenshire coast. Only a few clearer breaks. The best of the limited brightness once again will be over the Western Isles and the Northwest Highlands. For the Northern Isles, a few bright and sunny spells along with a few showers coming in on those still brisk easterly breezes. Into tomorrow night then and you can see still plenty of cloud and we'll start to see further outbreaks of rain working their way in as the night goes on. And as we head into the second half of the weekend, it's looking a bit more unsettled. We have low pressure to the south of us. It's associated weather front nudging northwards, bringing some outbreaks of rain and we'll still have those brisk easterly winds. So plenty of cloud on Sunday breezy, lending a chilly feel to some North Sea coasts and outbreaks of rain. Some of that will be persistent and some of it could be on the heavy side. Temperature wise, about eight or nine Celsius at best. Heading into Monday, little ridge of higher pressure means those winds will ease down. So it won't be quite as chilly, nor will we see that cloud breaking across Western Scotland though. And then as we head through the rest of next week, unsettled at times, but it's turning a wee bit milder. That's the forecast. Thanks very much, Gillian. And that's all from us this evening. Goodbye.